Hi friends, I'm Scott Giles and welcome to Power Talk, my podcast here on Facebook Live and YouTube. I cover topics related to spirituality, hypno-coaching, and the hypnotic arts and sciences generally. If you want to know more about my professional work, check out my website, which I'll tag at the end of this video. Those of you who watch regularly may notice I have no green screen background behind me. I've been experimenting uh, with some different backgrounds, and the feedback I got from viewers is that it was just distracting. So you now see my office in all of its lived-in glory. For today's podcast, I want to focus on an insight from financial guru Warren Buffett that appeared in an article written by Bill Murray Jr. in INC Magazine recently. The article is entitled, With 15 Words, Warren Buffett Explained a Brutal Truth Most People Never Accept. The writer lifts up the following examples. The homeowner who is angry and frustrated when they realize that the sale price of their home does not reflect all of the quality improvements the homeowner made. The newly graduated student who got an expensive degree, working very hard to do so, who then discovers that there are few job opportunities to use it, or that the pay is so low you'll never be able to repay the student loans you took to get the degree in the first place. The lover who sought a romantic relationship only to discover that the object of his or her affections was not interested in no matter what he or she did or how he or she presented themselves trying to appear attractive and the entrepreneur who poured heart and soul into a business who worked hard only to see the business fail for some unexpected reason. All of these people failed because they did not want to accept the brutal truth that Warren Buffett stated. Here is what he said. Quote, you don't get any extra points for the fact that something's very hard to do." Unquote. And that is the problem. It's the false notion that the value of something is necessarily related to the effort or materials it took to achieve it or create it, because that's simply not true. I am a clergy person. We see this in religious ministry all the time, and it breaks my heart. And it's something I've actually tried to address when I was in denominational office as the president of the Unitarian Universalist Societies for Community Ministries to no avail. I got no one, nowhere. No one wanted to hear what I was propose, proposing, preferring instead to choose failure over change. And in my opinion, that has continued to this day. In most denominations, and certainly in mine, which is Unitarian Universalism, the training to join the clergy is hard. You have to get a degree, typically a three-year Master of Divinity or a four-plus-year degree, the Doctorate in Ministry. You have to go through an internship, a period of clinical training, and then an elaborate fellowship committee process, which includes an oral and written exam, assessments, recommendations, and so on. And after you've done all of that, you discover that the world is unimpressed by you, and if you can find a starter job, it will offer chicken feed pay. And that won't change unless you gain experience and reputation and become attractive to larger and better paying institutions, but only a few do that. Or you enter community ministry where you will compete directly with secular professionals as a helping professional. You can do well there, I certainly have, 
but only if experience shows you're better than average for the profession you want to practice, and that will take time, struggle, and hard work. All the hard work that you did to get there, to get the credentials to open up, don't guarantee success. And unless you do these things to acquire the experience and stuff, the pay sucks. You'll get to retirement never having earned more than what it would take to pay the interest on your student loans with the balance still due and payable. I long ago proposed that the solution for my denomination was to move away from the academic and professional model of ministry and focus on a lower cost apprenticeship model. It was uniformly rejected. Well, I had to do this and that, so everyone has to keep on doing this and that. Even though it's obvious that what was being done doesn't work and was unjust. I saw the same error made uh, in the chaplaincy and pastoral counseling communities, both of which I've been part of. Pastoral counselors and board certified chaplains trained for years beyond what their parish colleagues do. These are rigorous credentials to get and compare favorably with the training given to psychologists or other top tier helping professionals. But that's not how the public views it. The public thinks that what religious workers do is not as good as what secular workers do, and the secular professionals seized on that to push theologically based professions aside. They said that we were just superstitious or that our work should be available for free, unlike the scientific work of the psychologists that you can bill an insurance company for, even though the training was just as long, you read the same books, and in many cases, trained in the same classes at the same university as the secular folks, you just got a different degree. Chaplains and pastoral workers responded to this not by showing the scientific evidence, which is readily available, that their work was effective, but by doubling down on their already rigorous training. They made it far harder to get and keep the credentials they offered. It seemed like every time I opened a professional publication, there was another announcement that continuing education hours were being increased. The result was that these professional groups ended up with a very rigorous, expensive, hard to get credential that wasn't worth much and which the secular world did not respect. You see, the rigor of the credential was never the issue. The issue was the people in power didn't feel that chaplains or pastoral workers did anything really important. And you can't solve that perception problem by adjusting the continuing education. But that's what they did. And no one cared. And in my opinion, they eviscerated their own professions. When I mentor hypnotists, I see much the same. Some newbies get totally involved in complex, difficult to master hypnotic systems. And there are plenty of trainers, some of whom have not themselves ever seen any clients, who are happy to sell elaborate classes and protocols that specify exactly what to do in any situation. Here's what you do if the client cries. Here's what you do if the client farts. There's a rule for that, and you're supposed to have it memorized. I recall one trainer who used to say, don't dilute your training with me by studying with anyone else. Such arrogance. Now, younger colleagues don't much like it when I say that these systems don't matter. Instead, master a good set of basic techniques and give your style a chance to mature. You will discover what is a good match for your temperament and you'll incorporate that 
there's no one right way to do this. And I suspect that anyone who says that there is should not be trusted. You can't teach clinical wisdom or experience. You just have to stay in the ranks long enough for that to happen to you. And you'll learn what works and what does not for you. And you'll gain insight into your own functioning as a professional. And then you'll get the reputation that allows your career to take off. But at the beginning, don't buy into this mythology that the harder the credential is to get, the better it is. Beware of the tendency to make things harder than they need to be, because making something harder does not make it more effective. Now, I'm certainly not saying run out there and get some casual light training that doesn't really give you the knowledge base you need. There's a, a balance here you have to strike. But if you look at the most successful people in the world, you will see that they basically do simple things incredibly well. That's true of executives like Warren Buffett, successful helping professionals even, and I know about this, successful chefs. Hey, thank you for your time and attention today. I'll be back next week with another talk on a different subject, and I'd like to invite you to join me. It does help if you let others know about my videos, so please like, share, and subscribe. If I can be of help to you, feel free to reach out through my website, my Patreon channel, or email. Stay well and stay safe.